people here for the Bevan series lecture number nine. And my name is Trevor Bryant, and I'm in charge of running the series and inviting the people. And uh, Sherry, of course, does everything else. Um, and, and I really must thank her for all the work she does. And before I, I get myself all embarrassed, I'm going to hand over to the most appropriate person I can think of with the dirtiest dirt for an introduction. <laughs> that is Daniel Schindler from out of Bible. All right. I'm happy to introduce, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, my dad. <laughs> Actually, there's, this is satisfying for a bunch of reasons. You know, over my career, I typically will go to a seminar somewhere and we'll see someone wander into the seminar and they'll come up and they'll say, I thought David was giving this talk. <laughs> Papers, but 
Um, he tries to write one uh, paper for the public through the, through the public media to match every paper he writes. Not necessarily to follow every paper, but you know, just to, to give a, a public presentation for every scientific presentation and produce something for a newspaper or magazine to, to go with every um, science paper he writes. Um, in addition to all this, he has the most fun in life that I ever know. I mean, he has uh, a ski. Well, some of his hobbies are skis basically every day. If there's snow, he's out skiing. Assuming he's home. Uh, if there's no snow, he goes mountain biking. Um, he raced uh, sled dogs on the professional circuit for 20 years. Um, <laughs> 10 years ago, five years ago. Yes. Avid woodworker, etc. Um, all this made for great childhood, of course. So we're going to give it an anecdote for childhood. I guess the, the one beta memory that seems um, most relevant to this conversation is um, him <clears throat> telling my sisters and I that you know that our life is too precious and there's too much fun to have in life to waste it, wasting your time in school. <laughs> <laughs> so he always took us out of school, you know, from the time we were that old. You know, two two months earlier, we were took us off to the field camp and let us run run around in the bush. Took us on lots of uh, fun canoe trips and hunting trips and all the rest. School was definitely secondary. Having mm -hmm. fun and doing interesting things was was the primary reason for for living. And yeah, today's speaker, Dave Schindler. <laughs> up in the 
the western corner of Lake Athabasca, which it, of course is second in size only to uh, seven other lakes in North America, St. Lawrence Great Lakes and Great Slave and Great Bear. That delta area is a very rich area. The East River, which is three times the size of the Athabasca, joins the Athabasca and the Birch Rivers there, forming a huge delta, which is very rich in fisheries, a major staging area for waterfowl. Uh, lots of, of, of fish congregate. And as a result, for thousands of years, there have been a few thousand Aboriginal people uh, from two different tribes and uh, Métis, uh, the people who uh, interbred with some of the first white settlers, uh, all living in that Delta area <coughs> and making a good livelihood. Well, between Fort McMurray and that site lie the oil sands. And uh, uh, the oil sands uh, on a map look like this. We're going to be talking mostly about this area, the surface mine, shown in this pale pinkish color here. But uh, they're also planning to develop this area outlined in red, which, to put it in scale, is roughly the size of the country of Greece or the state of Florida. And uh, uh, they're claiming that there won't be a lot of damage to that area. Uh, but I'll show you some slides that, that suggest that. You can see an area how this uh, relates to Greece or several other European countries. It would be a moderate-sized European country. I wonder if it wouldn't be a good idea to trade the EU, Greece, for uh, <laughs> And uh, when they get down mining, the surface mining, it looks like this. And the Canadian environmental assessment process is such that when each of these mines, each one about the size of a township, 100 square kilometers, uh, is reviewed, they conclude that there will be no significant ecological impact and no cumulative impact. This is taken from a plane at 3,000 feet over the oil sands. Is this negligible uh, ecological impact? Somehow, I think you could fly a plane full of, of village fools around the world over this, and they would say, gee, I think they're wrong. I think there's some ecological impact there. But if you fly a plane load of politicians over the country, they think somehow this is just wonderful. So I, I can only conclude that they think we've all fallen off a turnip truck. Uh, we're trying to put one over really very smart people who uh, think they, that we're so stupid that we don't realize what's going on. And lately, now that they've uh, allocated all of the area that can be surface mined, they're telling us, well, the rest we're going to extract by in situ processes. Uh, one that they call SAG-D is most used, stands for Steam Assisted Gravity, uh, uh, I forgot what the drainage. Anyhow, they say there's no impact from it compared to mining. Well, that might be compared to mining, but if you're a wolf or a caribou or something that lives in this landscape, this is what it's going to look like. These are the surface mines up here in Fort McMurray. That's roughly 100 kilometers, so this is about 200. This is what the first development is going to look like when they have it fully developed. These uh, uh, steam and, and solvent mines uh, require very close spacing. And the little squares that you see in here are the well pads. And then, of course, they have seismic lines to survey where they're going to go. Uh, lines uh, cleared for pipelines and for roads and all sorts of other infrastructure so that when you map any sort of reasonable uh, buffer zone around these things, you end up with only a couple of percent of the habitat left for wildlife. So for things like woodland caribou, uh, these are some huge issues, and for most of the large predators that inhabit the area. Well, to 
despite all of that, the Alberta government is, uh, is busy uh, promoting the oil sands here in the U.S. and in China and everywhere else. Uh, about 20 years ago, they decided they really weren't tar sands, uh, despite what you get on your feet when you walk through the area, they are now the oil sands. All I can say is that I hope when all of this is over, there's some Canadian tar sands who are oiled and feathered using <laughs> oil from the oil sands. So they make this long list of, of tremendous claims of, about uh, how environmentally sustainable and profitable the oil sands are. And as a result, they're being exploited very, very rapidly. The uh, black line here, the heavy one, is uh, production in barrels of oil. And uh, the other lines show in various developments that come on stream. These are just the big developments. Overall, there have been about a thousand different developments. All of these have been through the review process. The score is a thousand approvals, no disapprovals. So uh, we have literally a, a rubber stamp process in place for these environmental impact assessments. Uh, these mines are still to come on stream. Typically, these are so big that between approval of the environmental impact statement and op operation is a period of seven or eight years, which makes for some very difficult time because that's about the time it takes for the oil sands to double. So you'd think that in monitoring programs, you'd be trying to project ahead a decade or so so that you could anticipate what the impacts are likely to be. In fact, if you look globally, you will find very few things that have been sustainable at development rates of 7.5% a year. Most things start going out of control and out of synchrony at about 3% a year, whether it's a housing project or hospitals or schools or roads or whatever. So you can imagine the chaos that's happening as all of those infrastructure uh, things uh, uh, try and catch up. When I first went to Fort McMurray, it was uh, 500 kilometers of basically mud road. Uh, at the end of this year, it'll be all four-lane highway, and that looks like it's not going to be enough. And the city of Fort McMurray now has grown from 7,000 to where it's now estimated to be somewhere in the order of 110, 120,000. Uh, that's an estimate because uh, there's not enough housing for people, so there's people living in tents and in trailers hidden in the bush. And, uh, uh, company gulags, which uh, they constructed on site so they can fly people from China and some Eastern European countries into the world and ships and so forth. So all of this has been criticized by a few what are considered very left-wing organizations such as the Parkland Institute, a uh, think tank at the University of Alberta. And you can see the amount of money uh, exchanging hands here. To put that in perspective, the amount of money invested in the oil sands today is roughly 20 times the amount that were put, in, put into either the Manhattan Project or the Apollo Project. So uh, you can see why uh, the amounts of money make some people who would normally not be very greedy become very greedy indeed. And as a politician with this amount of cash rolling in and the royalties, you can look very good very easily. Uh, you never have to raise taxes. In fact, Alberta doesn't have a sales tax. And the coffers, in theory, stay full. In fact, we're running a, a $6 billion deficit something's going wrong. How can you have uh, a, a <coughs> development that's generating $24 billion in net profit per year and still be awash in red ink as a, as a, a province? Something in that equation that doesn't work. So this is my list of equivalent to the, um, to the premier's promotion. Uh, I'll give you some short examples of some of these. I'm not going to talk about many because there's lots of articles on there, such as greenhouse gas emissions. I'll 
I'll talk about things that I've worked on and some of the things that I'm familiar with. We have heard a lot in the past year about ethical oil. Uh, this was started by a right-wing uh, uh, columnist named Ezra Levant. If you don't recognize him, he's roughly the uh, Canadian equivalent of Rush Limbaugh. And he's written a book and several columns so, saying that we should not be buying this oil from the Middle East where those nasty people are mean to their women and, and uh, worship another god and things like that. Somehow, I don't understand why that's any worse than displacing our own Aboriginal people from this area, uh, including uh, areas that we guaranteed 100 years ago under Treaty 8 would support them for all time. And all of this oil, 70%, is going to the USA. None is going to Eastern Canada. It all stays Manitoba and westward. So Eastern Canada relies on the same so-called unethical sources that the U.S. is trying to get rid of. A typical company is declaring $2 billion a quarter in profits. And as I mentioned, there are 11 of those companies now on the screen with two to come. And uh, the Alberta Department of Environment spent $300,000 for monitoring last year in the oil sands. They spent $25 billion <coughs> on substantiated propaganda on billboards on Times Square and advertisements in European and American magazines and so forth. So the whole picture is pretty unsafe. <coughs> most recently, uh, with probably the most right-wing uh, group in power that has been there since uh, I moved to Canada almost 50 years ago, uh, we have a natural resource minister who's come out as an unabashed supporter for pipeline groups. And uh, he's running around telling people that uh, left-wing American groups are infiltrating Canada and uh, putting big money into these uh, uh, green groups that are inciting the natives to, to uh, oppose the oil sand doesn't mention the fact that China and other countries are putting billions of dollars into these promotional campaigns for the oil sands, into the building and planning of these pipelines, and that they'll stand to uh, make big profits. So this guy is, is uh, very strange. Also, I don't think it's Greenpeace and the Sierra Club that uh, people are listening to. Why would they, when some of the people saying the same thing are ex-premiers? Peter Lauge is the premier who started the oil sands development some 35 or 40 years ago. And he's now saying we're going too far too fast. Uh, the government likes to make a, a big thing about <coughs> carbon capture and storage, carefully not explaining how you capture and store carbon. Uh, carbon from monster trucks that are carrying around in the landscape. And uh, well, some journalists have been smart enough to discover this program isn't working. Jim Prentice was the federal minister of environment, saying that the oil sand sector must clean up its act. So with folks like that saying the same thing as Greenpeace, I think I can guess who uh, the investors are listening to. And companies are doing it for themselves. Uh, it's been known for years that these tailings ponds have a tarry surface and that occasionally blocks of waterfowl land in them and they never take off again. But a journalist happened to see this happen a few years ago who won a Syncrude's uh, ponds. This was during a snowstorm in the spring. Syncrude's employees had decided the weather was too nasty to put out the the uh, air cannons and scarecrows that were supposed to deter ducks and that they'd wait for nicer weather. So this is what happened. A good old sin group, instead of quietly paying their fine, hired a high-powered lawyer who made sure that there were oiled ducks uh, lying dead on the front pages of every newspaper around the world day after day for over a year before losing the case and, and paying the fine. So 
industry is also doing a number on itself. Green groups have very little to deal with it. Uh, some of the, the things that I find the most scary are the volumes of these huge tailings ponds. As I mentioned, the size, 141 square kilometers in, in total, with depths ranging up to 100 meters, is more like a toxic Great Lake than tailings ponds. This uh, compares the size of the tar sands tailings with the next biggest uh, tailings pond. This is the Faro uh, lead zinc mine that recently closed in, in uh, the Yukon territories. You can see this huge discrepancy. A few years ago as a class project, I had uh, a group of graduate students look into what happened with tailings ponds, how safe these dikes really were. And uh, they found 184 cases of tailings pond failures uh, over a 20-year period. Most of them on the order of about a percent the size of a tailings uh, pond in the, in the tar sands. And some of them with uh, enormous multi-billion dollar cleanup costs, such as this real agrio uh, dike in, in Spain, uh, which uh, let go during a rainstorm and discharged down into this river basin. That dike had been inspected by engineers only two days before this happened and pronounced as safe. And uh, lots of other cases and lots of causes that they uh, came up with in this venture. So, uh, and it's well known uh, that back when oil was 13 or 14 dollars a barrel and they were losing money by these early ventures, they were busy trying to sell these developments to various investors at that time from Japan and the UK and uh, Germany. And the investors would take one look at those tailings ponds and say we're not interested. So those tailings ponds are probably the biggest issue. If one of the bigger ones were to let go, they would uh, go under ice uh, the full length of the Athabasca River that happened in winter, uh, end up in Lake Athabasca, flow out into the Slave River and down and through Great Slave Lake, but down the Mackenzie. Uh, and uh, there's no technology for removing this material under ice. The river's ice covered for five months. By that time, it would easily make the boat from sea. So you can imagine what sort of consequences Reclamation is another big issue. My wife works in reclamation in the oil sands, and a typical area where they're digging for bitumen looks like this. It's what she would call a wooded fan. Uh, there's uh, several meters of peat that have been laid down over the last several thousand years, and some spindly spruce trees sticking out of it, typically 10 meters or so high, and four or five inches in diameter. Therefore, they're worthless in the eyes of a politician. I can only get one two by four out of a tree. Uh, not so worthless to caribou, but caribou don't count. Uh, she and one of her students and, and I have a paper that will be coming out in proceedings to the U.S. National Academy either next week or the week after that uh, shows that what they're promising about oil sands put it back just the way it was, isn't going to, to be the case. This is their best restoration project so far. It was a, a pile of clean sand they pushed aside when they were bulldozing down to get at the Duma. They planted trees on it. You can see the rows here. And after 20 years, they stocked bison on it. And they're very proud of this. It is probably not a bad restoration job, but it costs, <coughs> the Gateway Project here, costs 10 times what the companies are required to put aside per hectare of reclamation. So you have to ask, who's looking after the difference between what companies are putting aside and the actual costs, recognizing that this is one of the easier sites some of my wife's pictures of so-called reclamation sites that look like this. Uh, 
these are not the ones that they advertise on TV, but uh, they have some big problem areas uh, in reclamation. And uh, as I mentioned, they've done very little. The white bar here is the area that's under active reclamation. The only site that's been approved so far is that 100 acre gateway site that I showed you. And what uh, the Alberta government calls reclamation depth is mined area that there is no attempt so far to reclaim. Well, one of Suzanne's PhD students, Rebecca Rooney, went back to see what their actual recovery plans were. These are all given in written form in, in the, their environmental impact statements. And somehow their PR people never bothered to read that. It's probably too complicated. But uh, to show you some of what it shows here, don't try to puzzle through this. If you're interested, when the paper comes out, it'll be clear. But these grayish areas are the sorts of wooded fens that I, I showed you. And these uh, darker pink areas are uh, more wooded sites and so on. That's what the country looks like before they dug it up. This is based on about 40% of the area for which there were such plans. This is what they were going to be put back. On TV it says they put it back just the way it was. But in fact, because they had an NFIT lake, uh, there are 27 NFIT lakes uh, that are, have been approved so far. These are supposed to be replacement habitat for fish. Uh, to replace the streams that they dig up totally uh, in the process of mining. But in fact, what they are is a, is a pit with tens of meters of toxins in the bottom. They pump about 10 meters of water overlying that from the Athabasca River and call it a lake. And the first one of these was produced in 1997. It doesn't grow anything yet, but somehow it's uh, still said that these will be fish habitat. And Fisheries and Oceans uh, has been told by the powers that need to consider these as replacement for fish habitat. And uh, the Energy and Utilities Board that holds the hearings has approved 27 of them with more approvals uh, coming in the coming year. Instead of bogs and fens, they'll have these narrow these narrow little uh, wetlands that will be saline marshes. They're saline because they, they mine right down to marine sediments. And the groundwater then trickles down and runs across those, and it's very saline. And any wetland scientist will tell you that you don't try to grow uh, sphagnum and other bog and, and fen species in saline water. So the only thing they found in reclamation that will work there are the sorts of plants that you find around saline closed basin lakes in Saskatchewan. The area will be hilly because they have to put the materials they've taken out of these end pit lakes uh, uh, somewhere, and it's like digging in the garden. It's fluffy, and uh, so this will be a hilly area, not a flat area like I've shown you. So we make the case that it's time they confess they're not going to put it back the way they, they that it was. And, and stop claiming that they're developing reclamation yet and get on with some sort of reasonable rec uh, reclamation so that uh, our, the next generation isn't uh, left holding a bag for, for hundreds of, of uh, square kilometers of unreclaimed land. As a result of the disappearance of those wood fence, woodland caribou in the region are on the skids. Uh, in an announcement uh, just a month ago, the, whoops, uh, the Federal Minister of Environment showed this map put together by <coughs> scientists. Red here means uh, uh, populations of woodland caribou that are un very unlikely to be recoverable. Note that all of these are in Alberta or adjacent British Columbia. <coughs> and it's explained away that this isn't enough to put any effort into reclaiming these because there's lots of caribou elsewhere in Canada. So the minister has uh, refused to declare them as an endangered species. So 
big public controversy about. I sort of question why, because we were already presented evidence that that was going to happen over 20 years ago. So all that science has done is, is uh, sort of provided the obituary for, for the error in Alberta. That same area has Aboriginal people who depend on fish and uh, waterfowl and woodland caribou. In an area known as Treaty 8, uh, if you look at the history of Treaty 8, it includes a huge area of three provinces and part of Northwest Territory, <coughs> so several Indian tribes. Uh, there was a team sent around in 1899 to persuade Native groups to sign on to the treaty. There were never Indian wars in Canada. There were no Indian tribes ever conquered, uh, at least in the West. So all of these were based on goodwill, and Native people agreed to share their land for a price that uh, amounted to three to five dollars per year for each of them. And some of the treaties, uh, uh, as I'll show you, were pretty, pretty strange. Trees. But what's happened in the oil sands is that <coughs> native lands, this uh, red line uh, outlines the area that was uh, guaranteed to the Chippewa group in the Athabasca Delta for Chippewa. Uh, the various colors show the hot spots of their use of this area. The shaded areas are areas that have been leased without consultation. Aboriginal people to oil sands mining uh, companies, with the excuses they're not uh, they're not leasing the surface rights, the subsurface rights. So if you saw those pictures, you can see that you don't lease the subsurface rights and develop them without doing things to the surface rights. And yet the uh, guarantees in Treaty Eight are straight out of a B Western. They guarantee. Uh, things like as long as the sun shines and the rivers flow, you will be able to make a subsistence living with hunting and fishing in this area and on and on. And uh, the correspondence that was revealed, uh, this, this book is quite interesting. Father Rene Pomolio was a missionary for 50 years in the area, retired to Calgary and via the University of Calgary published almost 600 pages of his memoirs, including interviews with people who had been present at the signing of Treaty 8. They told uh, native people that this land is worthless, that we're, through our goodwill, we're going to give you a little bit of money for it, but if you don't take it, uh, we'll go away and we'll never come back. Uh, and uh, Bellacombe was the only white person that people trusted. This is Father Pierre. Lacombe, who was one of the early missionaries, uh, who again lived 40 some years, and uh, they dragged him out practically on his deathbed and prodded him north of the treaty team to convince uh, native people to, to sign on to the treaties. And uh, there are dozens of, uh, of interviews just like that. Uh, that and, and the wording, well, part of what you found happened if you read the correspondence. Canadian government knew the oil sands were there and that there was a lot of petroleum and they were urging their treaty groups to get on and get this treaty so we're guaranteed access to the, those petroleum reserves when the time comes to, to develop them. Native people were never told that and of course they had no concept of ownership. In their view they didn't own anything, they were part of the landscape. And uh, when the treaty people came, uh, they, were, they were promised things. And they were said, look, we can't put this into the treaty. See, it's all written here. But we'll put it in when we get back to Ottawa. Some, so some of the guarantees that were people were told would be put into the treaties were never put in. So there's a pretty strong, largely oral case that people were really screwed over in doing these treaties. At some point in the near future, there's going to be a big uh, 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 historic battle in the courts over this. It will probably occur within my lifetime. The Canadian Constitution.
Constitution only uh, uh, 30 years ago uh, verified that these treaty rights were constitutionally uh, sound. And there have been several cases, won by Native people since. Well, meanwhile, in this particular community, there's been, a, in people's eyes, a, a higher than normal answer rate. Uh, this study was done after a big controversy in 2009 by several cancer experts. They did find that there were 51 cancers where the higher, where the amount expected would be only 39. Confidence limits are very broad because this is epidemiology done on a couple of thousand people. And one of the problems, of course, is that most people don't understand that you need to work with populations of hundreds of thousands to get decent epidemiological uh, statistics. But some of the cancers that people were dying of were pretty rare blood and lymphatic and biliary tract cancers. Case of biliary tract cancers, there have been documented similar, similar cases reported in fish exposed to many of the same organic foods namely uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So this has been enough to generate a lot of interest in, in uh, uh, causes of, of cancers in the area and whether they truly are higher than would be expected and whether they're higher because of exposure to oil sands. I'll be coming that, back to that in a few minutes. Meanwhile, the government's position has been well, nothing is getting into the river from oil sands development, so how could we be causing any cancers? This is the position that they've taken until uh, the last few <coughs> months. If, if they were right, there would be a few seeps like this that do occur in the area. They've been known since the uh, late 18th century when Alexander Mackenzie and Peter Pond first visited the area. That's where their aboriginal guides stopped to get tar and patch their birch bark canoes. And they're recorded in their diaries. But there are fairly few of these, and they're fairly small. And that would uh, uh, make the Alberta government claim that those were responsible, but not uh, developments that look like this. And as someone who has studied watershed uh, disturbance for 40 years, that just doesn't water. Water <laughs> science 101, if you take the soil and, and uh, strip the vegetation off a watershed and rain and snow on it, uh, anything that's chemically in that disturbed geological substrate is going to run downhill. This is the Athabasca River, and even worse developments are occurring on many of the tributaries. So to me, that was sort of red flag number one. Number two is that uh, they were claiming that they didn't need to measure airborne contamination because uh, they weren't finding any. So they stopped the program in the 1970s. Uh, I pointed out to the minister that in 1981, I was part of a, a National Academy committee that studied airborne emissions from coal-fired power plants and smelters, we didn't find a single case that did not emit lots of airborne toxic metals and, and acidifying substances, et cetera, to the atmosphere. So somehow the politicians were suggesting that uh, the smelters in the oil sands, which burn coal and smelt this bituminous sand with a big suite of of toxic trace metals and organic compounds in it, suddenly, suddenly it's like the immaculate conception. We just didn't believe this would happen. They kept pointing to their, their uh, uh, great uh, monitoring program, which was called Regional Aquatic Monitoring Program, or RAM, totally run by industry, although it was supposed to be run by a stakeholder panel. Uh, was reviewed in 2004 by this group, and I happened to get a copy because I did one small part of the review. 100 pages and 99% of it was critical of what was being done. Uh, they managed to deep six this report until uh, 
when the controversy started mounting a few years ago, I handed off my copy to a, a journalist. And, uh, this is now available on the website. In their embarrassment, they got themselves re-reviewed in 2009 with the review released in 2010. This report uh, recognizes seven areas of objectives in which they succeeded at none. Uh, the latest report recognizes the same, the same seven objectives, but they only failed in six. The one that they didn't fail at was getting themselves re-reviewed. So uh, this program should be over, and we'll see. The other thing was that some of the monitoring by that group was bad enough, the province decided to do its, it itself for polycyclic aromatics for the last few years. But somehow, from monitoring a few sites, the ones with five-sided stars on the Athabasca, and single sites on some of the mine tributaries represented here by the four-sided stars, they were able to separate the contribution of industry from the contribution of natural sources and declare them all natural sources. So after arguing with the minister about this for some time and showing him graphs like this, which are industry's own admitted emissions to the atmosphere, I could show you a hundred of these. So you pick a, a toxic element on the periodic table and industry's reporting it's going up in their emissions. And these are three of the most controversial ones. This has to be going somewhere. For didn't want to hear. So uh, three of us who met coincidentally as part of a uh, provincial panel considered the impact of an oil spill into a lake near Edmonton caused by a train derailment uh, started doing some comparisons of that lake, the oil sands, and the Exxon Valdez. And by far the biggest problem oil sands. We calculated for example that the PAHs that were uh, disturbed and lying in tailing ponds around the landscape were roughly 3,000 Exxon Valdez's worth. So what we did was uh, to raise money from foundations. Uh, the top three of us here were involved in that. We hired a, a, a girl, Erin Kelly, who had done her PhD with me on Mercury a few years before to execute the field program. And uh, she started by doing a GIS map of the geological formations in the area. The whitish area here is called the McMurray Formation, which is where all of the uh, bitumen that they want to extract is uh, located. And uh, we put in a much more detailed cross-section of uh, stations to monitor. The red uh, circle here is, uh, serves another purpose. It's the uh, radius to which we could detect airborne contaminants coming out of the, the uh, two sites uh, where the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, upgraders are located on the river. So for each of the tributaries, rather than just monitoring it at the mouth, which is what province we uh, check this, it's all natural hypothesis by having one station outside the McMurray Formation. And going downstream, we have one inside the McMurray Formation, but, up, but upstream of major development. And then one below uh, industry, downstream of both industry and natural sources. Compare three stations on each tributary. We did polycyclic aromatics and we did uh, a broad sweep trace elements. We put together one paper on the 13 elements that were on EPA's list of priority pollutants, uh, having all of the analyses done by certified laboratories so that they wouldn't be found in reports. And polycyclic aromatics, there are hundreds of these in oil sands. Uh, these are just depictions of three that are well-known to people. Benzoate, pyrene is the main uh, carcinogen in cigarette smoke, for example. In the oil sands, some of these uh, are technically not polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons because they have a, a 
uh, a straight chain with sulfurs on it or a straight chain hydrocarbon hanging off of these. So we called them polycyclic aromatic compounds because there were the sulfurs, uh, sulfurous compounds are known as benzobiobenes and aliphatic uh, 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 aromatic hydrocarbons on them as well. We were able to do this because of who the U.S. president was at the time. Uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, had been studying around the Exxon for 20 years using this sampling system they had developed, which uh, enclosed a special polyethylene membrane in these uh, uh, samplers that were designed to prevent damage to the membrane. These are just sections of aluminum pipe with screens over them. They toss these into in, uh, the Gulf of Alaska or other uh, water bodies, let them equilibrate for a month, and they found they give uh, a good estimate of the amount of, of uh, polycyclic aromatics in the water column within a factor of two of, of the actual concentration. Well, under George Bush, they didn't have money to use these anyhow. So we sent them back last year for the for the still in the Gulf Neck. But we deployed those in the river. We did one sampling in February, March of 2008, and another in June, July. This is the river in winter. It's covered with ice and snow for about five months. Year. So the reason for choosing the dates for the winter one was that on the second date when we picked up the, the samplers, we could also get an assessment of the winter's accumulation of these contaminants in snow. And I'm going to show you mainly snow results. We're interested in snow because the effects of snow once it melts are well known from massive rainwork. Uh, in the eastern U.S. and Canada and Scandinavia and Scotland and Czechoslovakia and you name it. When snow accumulates contaminants for four or five months and then it melts in a few weeks, you get a tremendous uh, pH decline. Uh, two units. Uh, these are 1990 data when two of us uh, ran a pilot program to try to get enough evidence to raise some money to study this phenomenon in the oil sands. Uh, these are comparable pH depressions, what you see in areas polluted by acid rain. And about two, two pH units is enough to usually cause some biological damage. We were told it would cost too much, so we never did get the money to take this any further at the time. And of course, since we collected these data, there's been roughly a five-fold increase in emissions from the oil sands. So in the study I'm going to talk about, we measured these trace elements in snow profiles. The tip-off is to whether we might find something in the fact that the snow is gray. And when you get a profile like this, you can see the black layers in the, in the snow. And some lines connecting them. So what we did is to take a core at each of these sites, uh, melt it down and filter it. These were uh, white filters, roughly uh, uh, two centimeters across, 900 milliliters of snow water filtered through each. And uh, to orient you, this is the upstream end of Fort McMurray. This is flowing northward to the lake in Fort Chippewa. The yellow numbers are distances between the monitoring sites. The side chains are each of the tributary sites that I mentioned. So overall, this is on a grid of 226 by 74 kilometers. The red are the uh, locations of the major company developments. And site AR6 is where the two operators are, right across the river from each other. So you can see this general increase in, in particulates uh, shown as black on, on these filters as you get toward the center of the oil sands. 
Once it was filtered, the water looked like this. This is a pristine site over here, AR1, upstream near Fort Murray. This is AR6, the most impacted site. You can see an oil slick on top of the filtered snow there. Uh, we actually sent up another uh, round of, of uh, clean stainless steel pots for this after we discovered how bad this was going to be because we didn't dare reuse pots from these here. Uh, development sites for the ones far from development. This is what a, a paper towel looked like after just wiping out one of these pots after extracting that snow. We found that when we analyzed uh, these things, we could detect compounds out to about a 50 kilometer radius. This line represents that circle that was drawn on that map I showed you our sampling site. So snow was, was detectively polluted out to that far. Uh, to show you what the uh, individual maps look like, um, these graphs uh, here we're going from uh, south to north down river again from Fort McMurray to Fort Chip. AR6 remembers the, the site of the smelters. And in these bars, the black is what was in the particulate fraction, and the red part is what was in the dissolved fraction of that melted snow. So you can see these are just a, a, a bullseye around the development. So clearly there is an industrial signal being added to the pollution with very little pollution to snow at these remote sites. And I'll just show you a few of these. This is for polycyclic aromatics. Mercury is much the same, maybe a little bit displaced from the R6. Arsenic, lead, and the widely considered indicator of, of pollution from tar sands is vanadium. These uh, deposits are very high in vanadium. Of course, it's just like a, a pointer pointing to the center of the tar sand. So when we compared all of these sites within that 50 kilometer radius, all of our sites outside of the 50 kilometer per radius. Uh, radius, this is what the differences look like. The, the white bars are background sites greater than 50 kilometers away, and the dark bars are sites near the development. You can see the differences. The D is for dissolved, and the P is particulate forms of these various elements. So, clear proof that the industry was contributing to the pollution of this snowpack, and what we're hoping that a new contaminant monitoring program will do <coughs> is to document how much of that's getting into the river. Our 1990 data, which were only for pH and conductivity, suggests that it will be quite a bit, 80% or more. When you do the same things with river water on the tributaries, uh, here are the black bars are our winter sites, and some are our summer sites, and uh, the two criteria are with less than 25% of the landscape disturbed, and greater than 25%, you can see the same pattern. Downstream of industry, you get more contaminants running in. We had hoped that this week we'd have no development versus development, but between when the GIS maps were drawn and our, uh, our, our sampling, late 2006 to early 2008, some of the pristine area on these tributaries was developed. So we ended up with this uh, messy less than and greater than 25%. But it showed the same thing. And going down river, here we've lumped all of the sites upstream of development, all of the sites in development. P and D represents downstream of development and in the delta area. LA is, is Lake Athabasca, and you can see this clear pattern, again, black is winter, gray is summer, for more contaminants coming in to these sites in the developed area. So we put all of this together and published it in two papers in DAS with a small commentary by me in, in, uh, in Nature. I thought it showed fairly low levels of and showed that industry was contributing, but uh, none of the guidelines for health were exceeded, uh, unless you uh, melted and drank snow, which of course some people do. Uh, there are no guidelines at all in Canada for polycyclic aromatics, and nothing was violated there. But simply emitting these uh, compounds is in violation of the Fisheries Act, which is very specific. You don't discharge anything 
announced our studies, uh, though this minister admitted that he hadn't read the paper. Uh, <laughs> but after all of the press, the federal minister had second thoughts, as did the premier of the province. The premier remembered that I had a, a similar altercation with the over the in the early 1990s when they were forced to remove dioxin said, well, he's been right before. Maybe we should have someone else check these data out. So I immediately said, great idea. Why don't you ask the Royal Society to do it? Here's a list of qualified people, including some petroleum geologists. Then one day I got a call the same week from the federal minister, Prentice, who said, my scientists tell me I ought to take a closer look at your data. And if I fly to Edmonton, will you go through the data with me? So I said, sure. I met him at the airport with my laptop that night and spent two hours going through these. At the end, he was convinced. And he said, well, now what do I do? <laughs> so I gave him the same suggestion. Well, before he had reached Ottawa, he had a committee formed, hoping to report to him within 60 days uh, on what needed to be done. Uh, I thought the provincial minister would probably join in claimed to co-sponsor the panel, that he had a panel of his own. Uh, meanwhile, this regional aquatic monitoring program is undergoing its second review. Uh, the uh, 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 Auditor General's office is having its own review. Uh, and uh, after the Alberta Environment Data Review Panel reported that we were right in their monitoring program, not so great. They appointed yet another panel to design a, a, a world-class monitoring program. So we ended up with six expert panel reports on the same topic in one year. And they all came down on our side. So the minister was pointed, painted into a corner. Some of the reasons were fairly absurd. Rand had claimed for years that he could detect polycyclic aromatics. Well, this was their detection limit. These are our actual data. This is a, a fairly low sample. At this site, they would have said there are no polycyclic aromatics that we can detect. This was our highest site when, uh, again, this is their detection limit. They would have declared this as a sample that was not toxic, and our data show that it's above recognized thresholds for toxicity. And I could go on and show you several other examples, but Probably the worst report was the provincial panels, which said uh, some fairly nasty things, uh, like that their touted uh, monitoring program was never designed to measure the inputs of the, of the uh, oil sands industry, and that it appears that the laboratories they, they used were not capable of doing good enough uh, chemistry and uh, coming down heavily on the side of our study. So uh, Kelly is the postdoc I mentioned. We, we uh, did most of the work on this, so we ended up as being the first author. And of course, the papers followed all of this. So this brings us to where we are today. We have a minister who in July was forced to accept this world-class monitoring panel's report, despite being largely a business panel. They concluded that Alberta environment, industry, and Alberta and uh, the Canadian government were not trustworthy to run a monitoring program that should be turned over to an independent panel of experts. The minister swore that he would act on it immediately. It hasn't happened yet. Now they're claiming they don't have enough money to do it. Uh, some interesting problems that uh, I, I pointed out repeatedly need some investigation. I mentioned this fellow, Peter Hodson, who had run some uh, toxicological studies. So this is from a paper by one of his students here, three or four of them described some of the larval deformities that uh, they see in fish embryos hatched on contaminated sediments, uh, contaminated with these polycyclic aromatics. They found that only 5% of the embryos were surviving. 
and uh, that among those five, there's almost 100% incidence of these kinds of deformities. When we started collecting fish downstream, as people were complaining about, and uh, we found all of the things claimed. Uh, here's a lake white fish, they're being staple, big boomer on it. Uh, here's another white fish with a spinal deformity. Here's a northern pike with two tails. Uh, white fish with big hematomas on it, which is uh, something that they documented happening with the embryos. Eye and, and mouth uh, deformities were very common. Uh, another, this is a service of the tumor. Uh, a super walleye with one eye much bigger than the other. And uh, I think it's fair to say that these adults being caught are simply the uh, the larvae that have survived grown up joining the main fish population. Maybe that they don't have high level of contaminants, but I don't think they'd sell if you have them in the, the local grocery store. So I think there's a good reason uh, why uh, this food source is gone. That's one of the things I put it. My grandmother looks at what I bring home and she goes to the store and buys a can quick for dinner which is the uh, Canadian equivalent of spam. So while they may not be contaminated, they're having the same effect as which they were. So there's some logical next steps that I feel need to be taken in a monitoring program. I think the government has the expertise to do the monitoring, but they don't have any longer have the social license to be trusted by people that they report to. So what I would like to see is a program where the government does the monitoring, but it's under the supervision and the data are vetted by an independent panel. Something that will be worrying for the next year to get done. And we need some new approvals for the way these mines are approved, uh, not just uh, rubber stamps. So that's the story of the tar sands as I see it. Pretty unsavory mess. Uh, it's uh, we will have these expensive hearings coming up, but if you've been through a couple, uh, it's like watching an opera. You know, the singers are different and they have different voices, and there's a different backdrop, but you know what's going to happen when the family sings. <laughs> so thank you for.
stomping at the bit to get out to the wine and goodies outside. Please, those who have remaining questions, do feel free. Let's give our speaker one final.